And so without much further ado, I want to hand you over first to the Ombudsman for Children. The Ombudsman for Children has been focused on this for a very long time, and I would say it's an area of, of, of particular expertise um, for him. So we're very pleased to have him here. And he also recently spoke at the Oireachtas, the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Education and Skills on, on some of these questions that we have raised today. So I'm really looking forward to, to your response today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clean. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much uh, to everyone for attending, and I'm delighted to be speaking at the launch of the Rape Crisis Network Ireland report, Storm and Stress. Um, personally, I believe it's a very timely report, and it's very strong recommendations, and it serves to really highlight an area of today's youth culture that has been ignored for too long. I also want to commend uh, Dr. Michelle Walsh for her sterling efforts on the research. You know, speaking with or surveying nearly 600 teenagers, going on to interview over 90 of them, and then speaking with the, the very importantly with 21 youth workers, it creates a real robust data. For me, some of the findings that, that stood out um, are depressingly familiar for anyone who's worked in this area before. The fact that girls were subjected to higher levels of sexual harassment than boys more than double. Um, adolescents who identified as gay or pansexual were subjected to higher levels of sexual harassment than those who were heterosexual. Indeed, 68% um, experienced sexual or serious sexual harassment versus 20% of the overall group population. That's a really strong finding. And then teens aged 16 to 17 were subjected to much higher levels of sexual harassment. And the, the fact that they, and again, uh, Michelle highlighted very well that the, the continuum of harassment from mild to moderate. And again, even that's, you know, that's a, a difficult thing to consider. Sexual comments and jokes, sexting, seeing sexual images, being sent those sexual images unwa unwarranted or unwanted. That's mild and moderate. And then the serious sexual harassment itself then constitutes sexual assault, extreme uh, sexual harassment and rape. And again, huge numbers. Um, you know, it's harrowing reading to recognize that 24% of adolescents have experienced some sort of serious sexual harassment in the last 12 months. And even the 3% that, that Michelle talked about, out of the 600 young people that she spoke to her that were surveyed, that brings 18 people into the concept of rape. Uh, that's, that's stark, very, very stark. And again, as a psychologist, I've worked with very many of the victims of sexual assault, but it's, it's distressing just to be reminded of the impact of such an experience can have on those young people and, and how long lasting it is. You know, and again, Michelle highlighted things like low self-esteem, depression, uh, problems with body image, eating disorders, loneliness, uh, problems regulating emotions, all those things that build, all those things that build up in the future and last for a long, long time until, unless it's helped at the earliest possible stage. And for me, then I looked at the at the three areas, the top three areas where harassment happens. And young people say that they've seen harassment. And that's online, forty-two percent, with friends, twenty-three percent, and in school is twelve percent. And again, Michelle is is very clear in saying that, you know, wherever groups of adolescents gather, that's where harassment will happen. So we have to recognise that it clearly shows that we need to tackle this issue on a number of fronts, online is crucial, in schools is crucial, and in the relationships that people have across adolescents. Each of those areas suggests that the way a teenager learns and understands their world has got to have a clearer and more specific input around gender and sexual mores and appropriate behaviors. This is the truth, both of the virtual and the real world that our children and adolescents inhabit. And we know very well that those terms are more enmeshed now than they ever have been for any cohort of children in the past. The rapid rise in technology has seen a huge upsurge in new forms of image-based assault taking place on platforms most parents and teachers have never heard of. The dizzying speed with which certain social media sites and apps fall in and out of favor with young people can make parents feel inept and anxious as they try to protect their children online. It's clear that schools and the RSE curriculum are struggling to keep pace with these rapid changes and the dangers that arise for children and young people who may have their most intimate messages and photos leaked not just to their schoolmates and peers, but sometimes to the whole world. It is in fact a staggering thing for most parents and teachers to comprehend, but nevertheless, we need to find a way to give young people the skills to navigate this, navigate this new element of adolescence, because it's not going to go away just because the parents' generation don't like it. For example, 
in November of last year, just over six months ago, hundreds of thousands of intimate images of Irish women were released online on a platform called Discord without their consent. Some of the images were leaked from private social media accounts of adults, while many were, of the images were derived from private minors' profiles without their consent. We in the Ombudsman for Children's Office are members of the European Network of Ombudsman for Children, where there's uh, 32 countries and 40 different offices involved in that across Europe. We signed a joint statement on children in the digital environment in September 2019. It's a statement that we sent to all the European governments. And within that, we had a number of, of uh, recommendations. But I just want to highlight one in relation to the online world. That, and it has a couple of subsections. But we, we made a recommendation that requires all governments, business and industries to respect and fully support children's rights in the digital environment. And that include ensuring all platforms, providers, services, devices and products are subject to regulation and oversight which protects children's rights. So we want to really put the concept of children's rights to the heart of all those businesses that are in high tech, uh, IT and social media businesses so that we can really make sure that children's rights are at the core of what they do and how they regulate it. Second recommendation we had was increase oversight of emerging technologies. And these are crucial because I think they change so quickly. Technologies such as geolocation, connected devices, profiling, artificial intelligence, facial recognition software, machine learning and algorithms. If we can keep an oversight on them as they emerge, then that can be crucial. And again, you do that within the concept of children's rights. But again, simple things like nowadays, we have beautiful cuddly toys with technology built in where the camera from through one of the eyes can recognize the face of the child that's picking them up. You can say, hello, Mary, hello, John, hello, Michael, and create a personal relationship. But it also builds up data in the interactions and learns how to use that data for individuals. We have to be careful of how they also connect with Alexa and how they connect with cars, how they collect information on a totality of, of things that children interact with, being aware of that. And then finally, again, just one of the recommendations was produce child-friendly and accessible guidelines, codes, and terms. So again, putting children's rights at the heart of what uh, IT and social media companies do, creating all terms and conditions written in child-friendly language for anybody under 12. Adults can ask for a separate version, but all standard recommendations and conditions and guidelines are created in child-friendly language. And as we discuss, as we're discussing sexual harassment and recognize that over 40% of it occurs online, we've got to accept the truth that for all of our children born after the year 2000, the online world is their real world as well. Regulation of it is vital for the Irish government to come to terms with. But helping children and teenagers to understand and navigate it should be priority for all of society, from parents through to sports clubs, through to preschools, schools, secondary schools and universities. And again, it's that concept of the different systems that we that Michelle talked about that create this security and safety for children. Within the schools, nearly half of adolescents don't know, do not know how, the, how to report sexual harassment in schools, and nearly three quarters don't know if their school has a sexual harassment policy. That's got to be concerning for all school principals and the Department of Education. The impetus for this report was the dearth of research measuring the prevalence, nature and character of sexual harassment perpetrated against Irish teenagers. The lack of robust research that encompasses all forms of sexual harassment, online or physical, has made it difficult to determine the scale of the problem. And therefore there is also a lack of preventative solutions such as consent education. Though so I'm aware that the NUIG are working very hard on this particular issue at the moment and hope to launch a consent education program for second level students very soon. And that'll be very welcome. A point I've made consistently and, and uh, Kleena touched on it since becoming Ombudsman in, in 2015 is that the Department of Education needs to improve the collection, collation and analysis of data about bullying in schools. But it also needs to separate, inf separate out information on sexual bullying and sexual harassment. In 2016, my office recommended to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child that the state authorities should collate specific information and data on bullying countrywide to determine the issues and solutions that were occurring in schools. The committee agreed with that and recommended same to be done in 2016. And they have once again, in preparation for their next review of the Irish state in 2022, requested disaggregated data from the state about cases of bullying and harassment in school. And that's gonna be hugely important that we start to gather that quickly. 
in light of the number of consultations I've done since 2016 in our office, um, we've heard children saying that within their school they've experienced issues such as racism, homophobia, and negative commentary about their mental health. We believe this collection of data by the Department of Education is long overdue. Indeed, we can, we can but speculate about how much progress could have been achieved in areas such as sexual harassment, homophobia, racism, sectarianism, sexism, if such a collection mechanism had been developed earlier. They say that sunlight is the best disinfectant, and therefore it's only by having clear, robust data that we can start to shine a cleansing light on the extent of sexual harassment and bullying in schools and take the necessary steps to address it and stamp it out for all of our children. It really is an uncomfortable reality, but sexual harassment and assault is taking place among young people. In line with the results today that uh, Dr. Walsh's report has, has created, CSO figures released earlier this year show that 20% of detected sexual violence reported in 2019 involved juveniles as both offenders and victims. Today's report notes sexual violence is commonly directed towards young, young women and harassment is more common among young people who identify as a member of the LGBTQI plus community. Therefore, the evidence is clear that many of our schools do not create a sufficiently positive environment that destigmatizes and addresses topics and issues that are the cause of much stress and anxiety for young people who may be struggling with their sexuality. This report suggests that sexual harassment can occur as part of a continuum of behavior. And it hypothesis, hypothesizes that it can occur where social norms promote a rigid gender role, which in turn can offer a degree of acceptance of various forms of sexual violence. The report also suggests that there is a growth of individualistic outlooks in the adolescence. And the way I've understood that is that it means a more self-centered or selfish mindset as a result of shifts in societal norms and how we communicate and use technology as individuals versus doing so in groups. And that move away from sort of peer and group work to individualized IT-based interactions. And as I come to the conclusion of my speech now, I think it's chilling to consider that we are possibly raising a more self-centered population of children and that as a society, we are not affording them sufficient opportunities to experience the growth that comes with open, frank and clear discussions around their sexuality, their moral responsibility towards others and the importance of protecting those weakest in society. To protect all of our children from sexual harassment and assault, those things need to be modeled at home within our schools and across our society. Always remember the key rule of teaching or parenting for any adult is, they don't do what we say, they do what we do. So we need to challenge our own selfish and self-centered mindset. We need to challenge our rigid gender roles or our beliefs about what gender a person can be in their lifetime. We need to challenge misogynistic or homo transphobic comments at every occasion. We need to model for our children how to ask for consent in all the right situations. We need to teach them about being respectful of their own and others' bodies when being intimate. And we cannot shy away from that. Finally, we need to show empathy and caring for those deemed weaker by others. And we need to ensure that all our children see us modeling such behavior as often as possible. In conclusion, I'm very happy to launch this report and I again commend Dr. Waltz and all of the RCNI for the huge effort that was involved in bringing it to fruition. I really look forward to the recommendations being taken on board by the state and the consequential reduction in the levels of sexual harassment in secondary schools. Thank you very, very much.